Hello and welcome to the hearing, our music review show here on the channel. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, because I have a long bio to get through here, on to this week's album, which is from 1994, Grace by Jeff Buckley, the iconic Grace. It's odd that you have a long bio, considering how young he passed. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> Jeff Buckley was an American singer, songwriter, and guitarist, known for his four-octave vocal range. If you know anything about vocal ranges, that is ridiculous. Um, his vo I mean, in the sense that it's it massive. Um, his vocal dynamics and the versatility of his guitar work, Buckley spent a decade playing with various bands and working as a session guitarist in LA. He amassed a following in the early 90s and began performing in both LA and New York. Um, during one of his trips to New York, he began co-writing with experimental rock guitarist Gary Lucas, who played on the album. Um, and he, he eventually moved to New York um, for the second time in, in 91 and eventually began to garner attention uh, the attention of record label executives, including Clive Davies, um, who was huge, works for Arista, signed everybody. Right. Um, after rebuffing offers from several record label, wait, uh, several record labels, and his late father Tim Buckley's manager Herb Cohen, uh, his father was a folk singer. Um, he signed to Columbia, recruited a band, and recorded what would be his only studio album, Grace, in '94. Uh, in '94, excuse me, sorry about that. Um, um, in 1997, Buckley moved to Memphis, Tennessee to resume work on his, on the album to be titled My Sweetheart the Drunk, his second album, um, recording many four-track demos while also playing weekly uh, solo shows at local venues. On May 29th, 97, while awaiting the arrival of his band from New York, he drowned during a spontaneous evening swim fully clothed in the Mississippi River. When he was caught in the wake of a passing boat, his body, his body was found on July 4th. Man, wow, he, I didn't realize he was missing for that long. Um, I'm not, I don't, I didn't look at any of the police findings, but you know, I'm sure it's been dealt with. It's been 20 something years. Well, right, right. But a spontaneous, a fully clothed spontaneous evening swim sounds suspicious to me. It sounds really weird. Anyway. Um, Grace is Buckley's only studio album. It was released by Columbia on August 23rd, 94. And while the album initially had four sales, peaking at number 149 in the, U in the U.S. And, and received mixed reviews, it gradually acquired critical acclaim and commercial success. As of 2007, Grace had sold over 2 million copies worldwide and been cited uh, by critics and listeners as one of the greatest albums of all time. Grace was produced by Jeff Buckley and Andy Wallace, um, who also has some amazing credits. Faith um, no more. And features Jeff Buckley on vocals, guitar, keyboards, dulcimer, and percussion. Mick Grondahl, there's that, that Scandinavian O <laughs> with this little slash through it in the name. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. He, on bass, um, Matt Johnson on percussion, drums, and vibraphone on track 10. With additional musicians, Carl Bergen on string arrangements. Gary Lucas on magical guitarness on tracks one and two. Um, Michael Tai on guitar on track five. Loris Holland, Oregon on track seven, and Misha Masood Tabla on track ten. Reminder, I don't edit any songs into the album or and into the episodes for copyright reasons, but down in the description and on our blog at johnscotto.com, you'll find Grace on well, links to find Grace on Spotify and YouTube. Finally, now on to the tracks. Yeah, I mean, I had him confused with someone else who had their only album in 1994. Oh! Who also covered Genesis's Back in New York City, which is an odd song, I mean, but they both covered it. Oh, wow. And who also passed away, Early. like, around 96, 97. Oh, God. Who was Kevin it? Kevin Gilbert. Name rings a bell, but I can't place it. Yeah, like I said, exact same story. Uh, oh, although, his, although his might have been a bit more intentional. I think it was more of an autoerotic oh. asphyxiation. Oh, kind of a Michael Hodgson something. Yeah. Right. So, and that that's actually when I figured out, like, when I saw <laughs> when I saw Jeff Buckley's death story, I was like, wait, that is not what I remember <laughs> hearing. <laughs> and then I realized, oh, when I and then I saw, I listened to his cover of Back in New York City from they mm -hmm. put on the next album after this. I was like, no, this is not the same guy. Yeah. Um, Kevin Gilbert's cover is much better, actually. Okay. <laughs> on to track one, Mojo Pin. 
love the way his voice melds with the arpeggio guitar arpeggio at the very beginning. He comes up with this very high vocal and this soft guitar. They merge beautifully. He sounds a lot like Robert Plant on the, the higher end of his voice. Oh, yeah. I have it. A stairway to heaven feel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, do, do you recognize who has used this uh, this particular song? This exact song? This exact song. It's like the music is painfully close. Who is it? The It's the theme song to the uh, experiments of Lane. <laughs> There's a similarity. <laughs> I mean that that whole you know duvet the the, the instrumental break in duvet um, yes. <laughs> is similar. Um, we'll be reviewing Boa later on. They are not at all ripping this off in general. Um, that little instru- <laughs> that little instrumental section in duvet is very similar to some. Of oh, it's Wesley's very stuff. similar. It's exactly what they were going for. Um, I'm not sure what year duvet was. It wasn't long after. Right, the rain is from '98. Yeah. Right. Um, Love the kind of surfy drum part. Um, his, oh, his, yeah. his drummer is brilliant, Matt Johnson. Um, and I love the kind of loose groove that it has. That guitar sound that they use. I think I think Ted Leo kind of used a very similar sound to it on his last album. Uh, uh, you know, it's really it, just a Telecaster. Yeah, pretty much. It is just very basic, but it, it's just such a good sound. Mm-hmm. Now, the band that this really reminded me of, who preceded Jeff Buckley by a little bit, um, who I think he was probably influenced by was Mother Love Bone. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I could definitely see that. You know, Chloe Dancer particularly, and then some of their other mellower stuff. Because most of Beckley's, Beckley, uh, Buckley's stuff was pretty mellow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Mother Love Bone's mellower side, which ultimately led to um, Pearl Jam's mellower side, stuff like, right. way, um, uh, what was it, uh, Release is very much yeah. in this vein, um, which is straight, could have been a Mother Love Bone song. Oh, definitely, um, yeah. That reminds but, me, you know, uh, and it starts and starting the album with a slow, kind of adventurous song that takes a lot of twists and turns was yeah. an in- interesting choice. Yeah, it's probably why it wasn't commercially. Yeah, because <laughs> he doesn't. Well, there's nothing really on this album that's commercial, which is one of the things I like about it. But I mean, it's ahead of its time. That, oh, yeah. That this, that this opening track. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I said, the, the this. Like when we talked about that um, for that theme song, it was kind of ubiquitous 90s sound by that point, by yeah, 98. Yeah. But here, this was kind of, I don't think this was done before this. I think yeah. it was very original here. And I yeah. think a lot of them, a lot of people were copying this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, love how it picks up from this really soft, you know, arpeggiated guitar and high vocals into these machine gun blasts. Right, that's the part I really love. <laughs> and then it comes back into this sort of loose groove again, uh-huh. and then into this like classic, like hard rock feel, and then builds back to the machine gun blasts. His song structures were just fascinating. Yeah. On to track two, the title track, Grace. Again, great opening arpeggio. I'm going to be saying that a lot. Um, loved his rhythm playing. His sort of the way he, an arpeggio I should explain is when you play each note of a, of a chord at once okay. instead of just playing them all at once or strumming it through. Um, yeah. Be- Buckley loved doing that and mixing that with these hot, you know, his the high end of his voice and these great kind of again surfy drum parts. By surfy, I mean think um, Buddy Holly's drummer, The Ventures, where the drums are very active instead of just holding down a beat. Um, I, the, I loved this song. Um, mm-hmm. I may I put it on my star list. This like, is my favorite from the album. <laughs> this, I mean, is so fucking good. Um, apparently, Radiohead were big fans. <laughs> yeah, they're another one who <laughs> borrowed from him. Yeah, because holy shit! I mean, this this might as well bid on OK Computer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's a bunch that I feel I feel like Radiohead's entire post grunge sound. Mm-hmm. They just took from this basically everything <laughs> they don't regret. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was like that motherfucker. I knew. <laughs> you know, I've always had a disliking for Radiohead. Uh, a lot of it stemmed from when they were confronted with a, a music journalist asking them, "So you guys are into Prague, like Pink Floyd now?" And they were mm-hmm. like, "No, we are not in that. We are doing something completely different that's never been done." And it's like. <laughs> 
no, you're pretty much doing Prague and yeah. Pink Floyd, dude. <laughs> and then to hear that... Well, Pink Floyd and a number of other things. But well, yeah, right, they're right. definitely Prague. But then to just hear this, it's like, whole, they, they just lifted their whole sound from this. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's later songs that might as well be Paranoid Android. <laughs> they fucking just took the whole thing. Mm -hmm. and, and back to uh, Grace... Mm. The vocals on this, at least in the in the beginning, are a lot lower, and he sounds so completely different in his lower end, lower yeah. range. Uh, love the harmonies on the chorus, all Buckley. He is the only vocalist credited on the album. Really? Oh wow! All of the vocals That's amazing. are amazing. I thought they were sure that he had like a guest uh, in helping uh, him. Unless there's no? something missing from, according to the Wikipedia article, the all of the vocals are Buckley. And it doesn't surprise me because when you harmonize with yourself, you know, through a recording, yeah, it sounds a lot tighter and a lot closer because it's the same voice as opposed right, to two different right. people trying to blend. It just naturally blends. Um, this reminds me a lot of, of, like I said, Mother Love Bone and Zeppelin. You know, yeah. we were talking about everybody who took from uh, Buckley. Buckley definitely took from Zeppelin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, I think they said before he passed while he was swimming, he I, I forgot what zeppelin song he was mm -hmm. singing yeah but he's one of the few people who borrowed heavily from zeppelin without ripping them off he like knew how he to do it swimming in the mississippi he, yeah. was, he was listening to zeppelin he, yeah he, yeah and he was singing along to it you know he a lot of people rip zeppelin off um hello greta von fleet or van fleet <laughs> well i mean there's and kingdom come and a you know, of course right a number of others um right but he knew how to do it without ripping them off. He borrowed without stealing. Well, wait, there's a difference between being having an influence, taking a concept, yes, yes, and making, making it your, your own, own and, and doing something with it. Right. And then just and just taking song structures and putting things together that are reminiscent, right. but not quite copyright infringement. <laughs> yeah. Kingdom come. Yeah. Radiohead. Great event, great. <laughs> great yeah. event, fleet. Um, and again, really adventurous song structure on this one. Um, as a songwriter, I, you know, so I'm not active at the moment, but as someone who's written a lot of songs, there's a lot of temptation to just do the A, B, A, B thing. You know, first chorus, first chorus. And he just had fucking Scrabble tiles that he just... <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, it's rather. easy to just do first chorus, first chorus, bridge, first chorus. <laughs> he just went where it took him. And I love that. Yeah. Um, more plant-like vocals. That's the only thing where I can really accuse him of ripping off a bit, because his high, his high in his high end, he really is doing a Robert Plant impression. Yeah, but he doesn't really lean into that too much. Um, no, because he does so many other things too. I mean, he, I, you know, like sometimes I think Freddie Mercury, you know, yeah, with yeah. like you know, especially goes falsetto. There's a lot of Freddie influence, a lot of plant. Um, and I mean, if you're going to borrow from people, those are the guys to borrow from. Yeah, yeah, they are. Um, loved the chaotic violin towards the end. There's this kind of sort of a little guitar solo. And then a violin comes in and just, it feels like they attacked it. The player just <laughs> yeah. randomly plays stuff and just beats the hell out of this violin. Loved it. Like I said, this is my favorite of the on the album. Oh, yeah. And... Going from one extreme to the other, track three, last goodbye. This is the weakest one for me. Um, I wouldn't say that. I mean, this is more typical of the, the era, you yeah. know? It's just, and I complain about this all the time, it's just too poppy and conventional. Um, I'm surprised it wasn't a single. Yeah, you know? Um, but I, I, there's some good. I do like the pedal steel, the steel guitar at the beginning. Really nice bass groove in the intro. And there are these two acoustics that are panned that make it really feel nice and spacious. But beyond that, it's really just a conventional pop song of the time. Uh, Radiohead liked it enough to, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> did they borrow heavily from this one? I feel they did too, yeah. <laughs> Radiohead is a band that I never really got into. I love the song that they hate. I love Creep. Um, uh -huh. And and I, I liked um, Karma Police, but after that, I kind of didn't pay much attention to them. They they always rubbed me the wrong way, <laughs> and then they, you know when I get this, uh, they're like, "That's it." Just reminds me why. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it's a band I really like. I should be into. Yeah, I, I'm surprised to hear that you don't like them because they're really textbook for you. 
but that's the problem. They are just textbook. Like mm-hmm. they are just following, you know, oh, this is what we're going to do now. We're going to do uh, grunge is no longer popular. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. and I mean, come on, Electronica. I, I mean, oh, they went into Electronica's? Lately? Oh, yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. Everybody did, you yeah. know. They just were following what everybody else was doing, right. but yet, pe- their fans were just like, "Can you believe this is what they're up to now?" And it's like, "Yeah," because that's what everybody else is doing. Yeah. <laughs> like Billy Corgan started doing this years before. <laughs> On to track four, "Lilac Wine." This was written by James Shelton in 1950 and has been covered by a I lot of people. I thought that this, this sounded like a standard more yeah, than anything is. else. There's a couple of them that sound more like standards. Mm-hmm. Um, I love how sparse and haunting the opening is. It's just voice and clean guitar. And, it, and this is a bit of a cliche, but it really did yeah. give me chills. I was kind of expecting it to break into a tango or something, but I mean, it's kind of like a boleros. I was actually kind of disappointed when the band came in. Oh yeah. Because about a third of the way the band comes in and it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, I really had something there and now it's okay. Whatever. It's cliche, a little cliche, nice string arrangement or keys. I'm not really sure what it is. Sounds a bit like a Mellotron. Yeah. Um, and then it briefly went back to this nice sparse arrangement after the chorus. It's that typical last verse build. Yeah. Um, that was a bit of a head fake. Um, but I, I just was really loved that beginning, and I was a little disappointed after that. Like, I mean, he does this well, but it's just not something I'm into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it <laughs> yeah. is very much a standard. <laughs> yeah. Um, on to track five, So Real. So it's hard to describe. Love the opening guitar part. It's just weird. Great. It's a ballad, but it's incredibly prog. <laughs> and the time signature just shifts beautifully. Yeah, yeah. Like you really like just. Lot. I love odd meters. Yeah, I I can get my foot, find my footing in seven and five and even eleven. He mixes time signatures because there is no finding your footing here. Yeah, this. I mean, this I really enjoyed a lot because mm-hmm. you're just. Yeah, you are off. <laughs> In places you don't think you get to go. And let's, at least until the chorus. Then it kind of finds a groove. Yeah. Um, love the Leslie guitar that's just very brief in before the second verse comes in. There's just this Leslie guitar that comes in. Again, doesn't, apropos of nothing, doesn't repeat, just shows up there. Um, <laughs> and then I was very pleasantly surprised, per, surprised by distorted guitar. There are these yeah. twin distorted guitar solos, one on each side. That just come in and just attack the song. <laughs> and then disappear. And they go away. <laughs> right. You're just like, wait, what? What was that? And then it gets really eerie for the last verse. Yeah. I I I, I it's one of my favorites. I just, you know, it didn't quite hook me enough to be my absolute favorite. Speaking of favorites, on to track six. Hallelujah. I this just say, what a, work do you really say about this song? This is a, a cover of the Leonard, Leonard Cohen classic. Um, this is probably the best known cover of the song. This is the late 90s, late zeros, Stairway Early to Heaven. Zeros, yeah. Um, Jeff Buckley's <laughs> cover is very well known. Um, I'm very... This is one of my favorite songs. I mean, I, I'm really going out on a limb and saying Holly is one of my favorite songs. Really? But, okay. <laughs> but I, I just adore it. Um and I'm very picky about covers because I had to look at the history of it. Like he's only like the second person to cover it from what I had, or third yeah, person it was to cover pretty it. early on. But since then, millions of people have done it. Like um, Dylan covered it in the late eighties. Mm-hmm. Uh, some other guy that I'm not sure I ever heard of. Uh, K- K- Case or Kel? Oh, John Cage. Was it Cage? John Cage. Because I first heard this. You nice segue. I first heard this song. First time I ever heard Hallelujah was in Shrek, the first yes. Shrek movie. And in the movie, it's John Cage's version, which is my right. absolute favorite. Um, on the soundtrack is Rufus Wainwright's version, which is a close second. Really like what he did with it. But that's why I'm so picky, because I'm, I, I imprinted on those two versions of the song. So when I first heard um, um, Buckley's version, um, lost his name right for a second, um, I was really put off by the kind of guitar noodling in the very beginning. Yeah. I was like, what are you doing here? This is nonsense. Get to the song. <laughs> um, and I really never gave it a chance until recently when I finally said, okay, let me get past that 
and see what he does. And it's a really nice faithful cover. Yeah. Beyond that. Um, there's only a few hallelujahs midway through and toward the end where he even deviates from the melody. Um, love the guitar sound. His telly was just, he played a, probably a vintage black guard. It <laughs> sounds beautiful. Um, since and, this though, since he covered it, it's been, it's been a done ad nauseum covered to death. Yeah. Yeah. And so I say, I'm really going on a limb. I, 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 you know, Cause I think everybody can figure out by now, especially where music is concerned. I'm a bit of a hipster. <laughs> So saying that something so overdone and so well-known is one of my favorites feels a little iffy. So this Stairway to Heaven, what else do you like? <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is just a really nice, faithful cover. Loved, the, he does kind of an arpeggio solo. A, you know, he just breaks down the chords and, you know, plays them note by note. Um, that was beautiful. I don't know why he isn't more respected as a guitar player tough to say i mean because you know, he was a great guitar player he wasn't very flashy about it really well except for some of those why. other songs yeah. where like he was fucking prog mm -hmm. genius and just <laughs> fucking uh, yeah. and, you know well radiohead liked him a lot yeah yeah <laughs> but he, he you him. know he's known as a singer and a songwriter mostly that's how he's, yeah, he's yeah. remembered for he's not remembered as a guitar player just a, a quick side note before we move on because it's holy what, what more can you say um <laughs> I only recently heard Cohen's original. You know, I don't know if I've ever heard Cohen's original, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> the thing is, as much as I love this song, there are two versions I've heard that I do not like. One is Cohen's original, and the other is Marion Call's version. Marion Call, as I mentioned when we reviewed her, my favorite recording artist. I do not like her cover, not like her cover of Hallelujah because she deviates from the melody. Oh. And I, I, I can't say really that Cohen deviated from the melody because he wrote the fucking melody. <laughs> <laughs> but you, if, uh, you've yeah. heard any true, Cohen, true. if you've heard any of Cohen's work, he speaks more than he sings. Yeah, yeah. And he kind of, he's a little Sinatra in that sense for me. He's one of three people who I like much better in covers than in originals. Um, Cohen, Springsteen, and Dylan. I like yeah. it when other people do their songs, not when they do it. I agree. Anyway, on to... Agree on, I'm not familiar with that much of Cohen's work, I know, but I mean, well, but the other be... two, I'm in yeah. full agreement on. Yeah, uh, I, I much love... like Springsteen covers. Yeah. Man for originals. Man, of course, Man for Man, uh, Blinded by the Light, the best version of that song. You do not want to hear Springsteen's. Um, <laughs> and for Springsteen, he wrote Because of the Night. The oh, classic right. Because of the Night, Patti Smith, um, best known version is probably 10,000 Maniacs. Beautiful song written by Springsteen. Um, you do not want to hear his version. Um, with Cohen, I only really know two songs, <laughs> Hallelujah and um, Famous Blue Raincoat, which, with John, which Jonathan Colton did a great cover of. Oh, yeah. Um, I've gone back and listened to the, regi the original. Mm. I just don't like Cohen's vocals, and I, I have a feeling it's a love it or hate it kind of a thing. He's a little too Sinatra for me. On to track seven, Lover, You Should Have Come Over. I love this song, too. This is a, this is the ballad, um, which normally puts me off, but I did like this one. Um, the accordion in the beginning was very unexpected. Well, it's kind of like this. Uh, it's soul, but it's like prog meets yeah. soul, like you, like you never really heard before. <laughs> it's got this nice triplet groove and a nice classic melody. It is very soul in some of the, right. the guitar parts. It, it, there's that quick staccato, you know, high yeah, high end hit on the guitar. It's I feel like soul. what we were denied when Otis Redding passed before. Yes, yes. you know, he got to uh, <laughs> love the sound in the Join mix. a prog band yeah, in the early seventies. Exactly. You know. Oh, oh. man. <laughs> <laughs> he was heading in that direction, wasn't he? <laughs> I know he would have. I love the sound in the mix of the drums. I gotta comment on the drums at some point. That's what I do. Um, they just sound huge, and it's Matt Johnson. I you know I can't give him enough credit. I want to hear him and uh, Gabe Nelson. I think his name was the drummer, the bassist on Comfort Eagle work together. Oh yeah. I just want to hear those two work together because oh. <laughs> I love it because I love the way they play. Um, a great background vocals again, all Buckley harmonizing with himself. Well, yeah, when you told me that he was the only one doing vocals on this, this was the first song I thought of because it was mm -hmm. like the backing vocals are fucking amazing on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and again, distorted lead guitar. 
Yeah. The end. Just beautiful contrast. Oh, yeah. Uh, we'll get to why that should only be a contrast occasional in a couple of songs. But first, on to track eight, Corpus Christi Carol. This is another traditional uh, written by Benjamin Britten. Uh, and Buckley's version of the song is based on uh, a ver the version by Janet Baker. A childhood friend introduced him to the song, and he sang this version, or put this version on the album as a way of thanking his friend. Love the sparse arrangement. This one delivers on what um, what was the earlier one? Oh, oh Lilac Wine um, right. cheated me on. It's just clean guitar and vocals. I mean, it's pretty much the same uh, feeling I got. Like, I, you know, he's doing this well. But it's mm. just not me. <laughs> not you. Uh, love the just this beautiful haunting melody um, and these high vocals. Uh, one of my favorites. I love that he just kept it to guitar and vocals. Yeah. Sometimes I was thinking about John Anderson from from Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, with yeah. some of his vocals that he was doing too. On to track nine, Eternal Life. This is the reason why those heavy parts should have been just sparse and occasional for contrast. Yeah. Because this is a whole song of it. Oh, yeah, this, this is, is like, the rock know, song. We're in the 90s again. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and it opens with a really nice bluesy riff. Definitely the heaviest. I, I love the distorted bass. Just love any yeah. kind of distorted bass. Um, um, it's another very well put together song, really. Just, yeah, I mean, yeah. it is pop. It is power it's, pop. It's but a nice it, change of pace. It, and, and it, like, whatever he puts his mind to, he does well. So, I mean, it's, it's more it, my speed. It's just a bit mu heavy and muddy and one note. Yeah. It, it just do it does it stands out in the wrong way. <laughs> this feels like the sellout song. Oh yeah. To me. You know, this is what he did to get on the radio. Surprisingly, it wasn't a single. Yeah, not but a single this though. Is, this is the one that was supposed to appeal to the times. What was the single from this? Was it just Grace? Or Grace was it, and was it I, Hallelujah? I think both, because he did videos for both. Yeah, and and Hallelujah is the one that everybody knows. So I think those were the singles. But um, yeah, Hallelujah didn't really take off to like after. Well, the album didn't really take off until. Well, right, after right. It. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Um. But this one, it, it was just kind of a mediocre rock song of the time to me. Uh, on to track ten, Dream Brother. Love the sort of meandering dobro. That's a steel body acoustic guitar. Played usually played with a slide. Huh. Um, kind of meanders in the beginning. That was a very interesting choice. And the tabla, I love tabla. Tabla are Indian drums. Okay. That have that very kind of um, watery sound, kind of like a, a water drop sound. Um, All right. Used beautifully on this one. He's back in his wheelhouse. Um, just you know mellow and adventurous and kind of weird yeah he's doing something very strange here sort of like a 90s take on like either moody blues or cream yeah yeah i can hear that yeah um the way the chorus picks up kind of surprises me surprised me yeah because it was started off versus just very mellow and loose and then the chorus picks up a bit um love the way the vocals kind of give way to this wall of sound in the middle and it's not a distorted guitar wall of sound. It's orchestra or strings. Oh, yeah. The strings just come in and just kind of sweep in in the middle of the song. And then it gets kind of heavy, but it's still haunting. And there are these long instrumental breaks without solos, <laughs> which is always an interesting choice when it's just a chord progression right. without a vocal. You know, not a lot of people can pull that off. He does. Uh, it should be mentioned that this was originally the last song on the album. Oh, really? Um, track 11 that we're going to get to next was released after he passed away. Oh, okay. So this was originally the last track. This was the goodbye. Um, oh, man. And in a sense, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 10 release is the last song, right? Yes. So it's kind of ends in a similar way where it's this mellow kind of reaching song. Because after release, uh, you get a, like a call back to the intro Mm -hmm. For uh, from once right the beginning yeah. of the album, but it, it's officially the last song, and it's yeah. kind of a similar thing with Dream Brother, where it's this mellow, reaching, big song to end on. You know, 
On to finally track 11, Forget Her, again, like I said, posthumously released additional track. Which also, honestly, it sounds like a good way to end an album, too. And it's, it's good. I, I would like to, I wish this had replaced one of the, um, uh, Last Goodbye, or, um, no, no, I wouldn't replace Eternal Life. It, it was nice to have a rock song in there. But I wish this would re- replace Last Goodbye. Um, nice haunting arpeggios in the beginning. Love the nice soft vocal. It's sort of like a less repetitive tied to the whipping post. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it's kind of a straight up blues rock. Yeah. Sort of thing here. Um, builds nicely to the chorus. It's just a good solid track. Nothing really outstanding, but it's just fun. Um, love how he trades solos on two different guitars on each side. Got one, on the, each, one on each side and they trade back and forth. The reason I thought this was the true last song of the album was because he brings back that same guitar sound he used oh, in yeah. the heavier parts uh, mm-hmm. of Mojo Pin. Yeah, true. At the very beginning. So I thought this was like a good right. bookend. So I'm kind of surprised to find out that it wasn't on it. And an organ solo, or not solo, but just bringing in some organ at the end yeah. was, a nice, was a nice touch. Um, and it's, it's surprising because it does fit the album. Um, yeah. But it, Totally. And I see what you mean by bringing the guitar sound back, but this would have been a disappointing ending if this had been the original last track to me, because right. it is, you know, it's a good solid track, you know, put it in the middle. Great. You know, it's, it's a lot like what I said about the first track on the bandmate album in the middle, it would have been fine. It's not a lead off song. This is not an ending song. It wasn't intended to be. In fact, it wasn't even intended to be on an album. Right. It was one that didn't make the cut, which is surprising because it is a good solid song. But think about it, though. The ending song does not have to end with the the climax of the album. Sometimes you put the climax yeah. of the album is the second to the last right. song. You can have a denouement. And then you have that last song, the kind of, you know, like one for the road sort of thing yeah, and just true. closing it out. And that's it. Um, so do you recommend it? Definitely. Definitely recommend it. I mean, there's a few weird standards that he put in there that I would could have lived with that probably, mm-hmm. but I mean, I appreciate his workmanship on them. I do recommend it as well. I don't think it quite lives up to its immense reputation. Like this is an iconic album of our generation. It's really strange that it's kind of like this lost thing to me, but 94 mm-hmm. was a very strange year to me. So there's a lot <laughs> well, yes, yes, I lot. missed. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't think it quite lives up to its reputation, but it's still really good. Um, you you would cut the standards. I would have cut the pops, the pop and the, you know, AOR song, but the rest of it is brilliant. He He's someone like, and, and I, I hesitate to mention anyone else in the same breath as this person but he's like hendrix for me in oh the wow sense that you know a lot of people say what well, imagine what hendrix would have done if he'd lived yeah what he would be doing if he'd lived i i can you know this was his first album this was his you know debut which and typically debuts are often a little weak we've talked about right. this he did this on his debut 26 20 no 24 25 years later Imagine what he would have been doing. Right. And and the Kevin Gilbert story is along the same lines um, where, I mean, actually his thing was he was with Sheryl Crow. Okay. And pretty that much. That might be why he, re- yes, he co-wrote with her, did it? Didn't he, he co-wrote like a lot that's of her why first the album. Ring, that's why the name rings a bell. Okay. And so this was, they broke up once she hit big. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, then he went and did this album his own almost became the lead singer of Genesis. Oh, okay. In fact, they he performed at like Prague Fest, the entire Lamb. They sent it to Banks and Rutherford, uh, who were just happened to be looking for a lead singer. Mm-hmm. They sent him an invitation to audition. He died be- right before the invitation got to him. Oh, man. <laughs> Would have been better than the guy they picked. You know, the guy they picked was good, but yeah, he probably would have been better. <laughs> he was like a bit of a wild cat. <laughs> I'm kind of still wishing they would have picked Nick to Di Virgilio and just, you know, curtailed all of that post Neil Moore Spock's beard stuff. Maybe, maybe, but then we wouldn't have Spock's beard. <laughs> but no, but it would have curtailed all of the stuff after Neil Moore's left, which I'm not fond of. <laughs> They're still putting stuff out. They I know. put out an album this year or last year. I don't really pay attention to them anymore. I mean, they, <laughs> Spock's ended with. Was it five or snow? 
was the last one um, Neil was on. Um, yeah, I can't remember. I think it was Snow. Okay, that's where Spox ends for me. I have Feel Euphoria. A mm, couple of good songs, but never got into um, Octane. Yeah, that was... Uh, but X was good. Mm, I might have to check that out. Anyway, that's it for Grace as we tangent onto other albums. Um, until next time, we'll be revealing in Loving Well, Mem- there was a Spock's beard feeling to both this and... and- and Kevin Gilbert too. <laughs> oh, um, and Spox was a little was Spox was after. Yeah. Well, I mean, everybody was in Spox, but Buckley got huge after he passed. So yeah, wouldn't be surprising at all if Neil Morse was influenced by him. Anyway, as I was saying, until next time, when we'll be reviewing "In Loving Memory of" by Big Wreck, another album that I think was pretty heavily influenced by Jeff Buckley. Until then, always remember, never forget wherever you go in life, there you there are. You are.